my very distinguished colleagues, Justice Bhushan Gawai, I fondly call him HMJ every morning. Justice Abayok, Justice Dipankar Datta, Acting Chief Justice, Justice Sanjay Gangapurwala, Judges of the High Court, former Chief Justices of the High Court, former Judges of the Supreme Court, Advocate General Dr. Biren Saraf, ASG Mr. Anil Singh, Mr. Nitin Thakkar, Mr. Sanjeev Kadam, Ms. Parzana Behram Khamdin, all the members of the family of the registry and everyone present here. This is truly an emotional moment for me. And I'm not one who hides his emotions in his sleeves. <clears throat> Very often my emotions come out to the fore and I think this is going to be one such evening in my life. So where do I begin? For those of you who have a little penchant for music, where do I begin is that famous song from the movie Love Story, which was sung by Andy Williams. So as I was thinking about what to say, I said, where do I begin? I think I should first begin by acknowledging that I'm here because of the sacrifices of my own parents. My father and mother didn't belong to a wealthy family. We had some lands, but our lands were all taken away in the agricultural sealing laws. And my grandfather said that we will not contest the rights of the tillers because they were really the people who represented the soil. And so the family moved on and tried to find alternative means. That's how someone became a lawyer, somebody became a doctor. But much before that, around the last few years of the 19th century, my great-great-grandmother, who lived in a small village in what is now Rajguru Nagar, found that her husband had decided to marry for a second time, which was then permissible under our law. So she took nine children under her belt, mortgaged her jewelry, and brought them to Pune to chart a new course of life for the children of the family. So on the strength of that one woman who mortgaged her jewelry, came the first doctor in our family who became an FRCS in those days, the first doctor who became an MRCP, my own father's uncle who was a leading lawyer in Pune. And that, that's how really the family disassociated itself, so to speak, from its landed tradition into the more intellectual traditions and professions. But talking of my own parents, they were not people born to wealth. My parents lived in a small chawl in Dadar by the name of Madhavadi. And my mother would carry, I was not born, but my parents told me the story. And my mother would carry clothes on her head and with a bucket in the hand to the nearest water tap when there was no water to wash the clothes of everyone in the family and relatives who would be visiting in large numbers from Pune and beyond to Mumbai. And she would tell me a story of how when my father became a lawyer, by the first train from Solapur, from the overnight mail from Pune, from various parts of Maharashtra, the first train would arrive at about 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock at what was then BT. And with that would come the first lot of clients to our house. So my mother would first and foremost serve them at 5.30 in the morning, a cup of tea. And that's when the first few briefs would be gathered at home. But our parents had the vision of sending both my sister who is here me to an English medium school. 
to go to an english medium school was something very unique in our family because we were the first two in the family to go to an english school my parents started learning english from standard 7 but they learned a great deal of english and when my father was asked you had a penchant for english when did you study at the university of oxford you would say my oxford was nutan marathi vidyalaya in pune he never had the benefit of a foreign education which he gave us but he was a very strict man when i passed my law he was still in office and he said that i will not allow you to enter a court so long as i am a judge of the supreme court and he made that statement even without asking me before the bar of the allahabad high court i had accompanied my parents as a young student and he made that announcement suddenly at the allahabad high court now whether i liked it or not i had to abide by it but he told me one thing he said look i just checked up with my bank account and i have about 5 lakhs and 25000 in my provident fund account my gpf it's all yours to take abroad and study because i know you will not waste this and that you will use this and put it to good good use fortunately i didn't have to draw on it but that was a kind of those were the kind of values which i learned from my parents so i began my practice at a time when my father had retired there was an enormous amount of goodwill but there was goodwill either to be won or to be lost so i must begin this little presentation i hope you will not mind my being so personal by paying a tribute to my to my own parents because of whom i think i can be addressing you this evening but apart from that i am very touched by the large presence of members of the bar and of my own colleagues or judges who mentored me who are present here in such abundant in such abundant number this evening i hope i'll not embarrass you by referring to you it's conventional not to refer to those who are present but i'll break that tradition because i owe a debt of gratitude to all of you so just as sujata manohar i learned from you the kind of dignity which you brought to your office as a judge if there's one thing that you learned was the sense of being firm yet dignified in the court just as hemant gokhle you are here with minatai we shared adjoining chambers just next to the central court and not a day went by in the evening when justice gokhle wouldn't come by into my chamber give me a pat on the back and even share his favorite treptin biscuits for me to have better proteins just as sam variava is here i appeared before you in this very court when you would be ferociously writing orders in your own handwriting as opposed to dictating them to your stenographer because you were one of those judges who prided precision in all the work that you did and then after you wrote those orders and the the brief would be just flung at us by the court master the shirisdar you would try and take down what you had written in your own hand just as avi savant is here you are meticulous in your keeping that you know, case law compilation which i always had a dream of filching from your table but never eventually managed to do there was of course chief justice of the madras high court justice ajit shah who was my first bench partner when i became a judge of the bombay high court i was fascinated if a lawyer got up at 2 o'clock and mentioned the matter just as ap shah would tell him your serial number 175 and would start narrating the entire case from rote and i would ask him i said ajit bhai how do you manage this telling a lawyer at 2 o'clock that this is serial number 145 and he would do it with such routine regularity so he'd say nahi re thode varsha zala ki asa lakshat rahata cases so after a few years go by on the bench you remember those cases 22 years have gone by i can never emulate what you did ajit bhai 
Ajitai told me a very important thing. He said, and I share that with some of our young judges without meaning to be patronizing. He says, you have to decide what judge you want to be. Do you want to be a judge who will be known by the number of cases that you disposed of? Or would you like to be known as a judge in terms of what you contributed to the evolution of society? So the choice is yours. I'm no one to give you which lead to follow. But do make that choice. I sat with Chief Justice Mohit Shah. Chief Justice Mohit Shah had a very practical and apt way of approaching administration and judging. He told me that there are two kinds of judges in the administration. There are the Article 14 judges and there are the non-Article 14 judges. The Article 14 judges insist that in every decision of the administrative committee, you must apply equality, due process and fairness. He says the other lot of judges are more practical. They realize that the administration has to function. But Chief Justice Mohit Shah was the one judge who saved the original side because he believed that the standards of excellence of our court are attributable to the existence of the original side. I had the pleasure of sitting in this very court with Justice F.I. Ribello. And I was deeply influenced and impacted by his sense of balance. He brought with him the sense of go and calm. He never hassled anybody. He was calm to the core. He was calm at 11 and calm at 5. But even today, I do narrate to judges in the Supreme Court and beyond two examples of judges who came into the judiciary with a political background, but whose politics completely left them the moment they assumed judicial office, Justice Krishnayar and Justice F.I. Ribello. Which is to say that once you become a judge, there is something about our office which completely obliterates the birthmarks which we bring into the judicial institution. And I always mention that this is a clear case where a judge who had such an active political background was so far removed from it once he became a judge and dedicated his life to dispassionate and objective justice. Dilip Rao Bhosle is here. My only interface with the Bar Council was when I went to the Bombay University to vote for him when he was contesting the elections to the Bar Council of uh, Maharashtra. And later on, he had such an earthy sense of affiliation to the bar. And Dilip's wife, Arundhati, really, really stood by me as a true sister when things mattered the most. So when I said, where do I begin personally? This is really where I have begun personally. But we can't also not remember those who have made a big difference to our institution. When I was a lawyer in this court, I used to sometimes find spots in the high court to escape because otherwise other briefing lawyers and clients would come and search you out and not let you read and reflect and think about the cases which you had to argue. The large number of cases which we do as lawyers and judges, the great problem is that we don't have time to think or introspect or reflect. So I would go to a courtroom which was not occupied sit in the last row and sit down and quietly think about this case. And I would generally come to the central court where either Justice Rujata Manohar in those days, Justice Barucha or Justice Sam Variava would be handling the court, sit in the last row and focus on what I was going to argue. But sitting in this court, you could not but be deeply influenced by those two portraits which stand in front of us. Lokmanya Bhagangadhar Puktiyat and Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, and that plaque which resides very firmly, and I say firmly with a sense of purpose behind this court, is an emblem of the fearless instinct of the Bombay High Court. Because the Tilak sedition trials in 1897 and 1908 took place within the precincts of this court. 
Likewise, Dr. Ambedkar, the architect of our constitution, very few of you would know this, but my father shared this with me. Dr. Ambedkar would sit in a place called the Wayside Inn. The Wayside Inn has now gone away from Kalagoda. It was still there when I was a young lawyer and even a judge. And he would sit on those tables of the Wayside Inn, which had very, very distinctive tablecloths of pink and white checks and, and constantly be writing. Later on, these young lawyers realized that this was Dr. Ambedkar who was writing the text of our constitution. Then you had Maha Mahapadde Kane, the two Bharatnatas our court has produced, Kane and Dr. Ambedkar, Firocha Mehta, K. Munshi. These are really our own ancestors who have laid the foundation for what the court it is today. H.M. Sirvai, Nani Palkiwala. Sirvai was in the culminating years of his practice when I was a young lawyer. And I was arguing, there was a challenge to the validity of the public premises eviction of unauthorized occupants act in the adjoining courtroom where the bench consisted inter alia of, it consisted of Justice S.P. Bharucha and Justice B.N. Shri Krishna. Sirvai was then too old to stand up and argue, so he was he argued for the all, all the 42 days or not sitting in the courtroom. I was the last counsel to argue, and I was briefed on behalf of the National Textiles Corporation. And I was briefed because everything that had to be said in the case had already been said. But just the previous evening, there was a judgment of the Supreme Court which was dead against the point which we were canvassing. So I got up and I handed over that judgment to the court and said that this is purportedly in favor of the other side, but I must bring it to your notice because this is the last word on the subject, maybe the wrong word on the subject, but the last word on the subject. And Mr. Sirvai got up and said, he says, I'm impressed. This is in the highest traditions of the Indian bar that this young junior has cited a judgment which is dead against him. Nani Palkiwala used to occasionally stray into our corridors, though he was then more in Bombay House than in the High Court. The judges of the city civil court were not given housing, unlike today, where all of you are given housing. Because the government had taken the view that if you had Bombay as your origin, then you better have your own house. So why should we give you a government house? And then the judgments on the Shetty Commission had not yet been pronounced. So just as so Mr. Nani Palkiwala would walk across from the Bombay house, come into our ground floor, borrow a gown from whoever was the junior who had a gown on him or her, wear that gown and argue for Roshan Dalvi and a whole lot of city civil court judges. And that's where the law was laid down that every judge within the Maharashtra judiciary must be given service accommodation. So it's important that we remember and acknowledge this debt of gratitude, which we owe, because after all, we are just pilgrims in this great institution, which has seen people come and people leave, some more eminent than the others, but all in the same tradition of the cause of compassion and justice. I came to the Bombay High Court after a stint in the Supreme Court. And the redoubtable Mr. Jangu Gagrath, I was planning to migrate to Mumbai from Delhi. The redoubtable Mr. Jangu Gagrath, I walked up to him and asked him whether I should continue to work in the Supreme Court and in the Bombay High Court. And he said to me, he says, if you want to earn a lot of money, please continue to be a lawyer in the Supreme Court. But if you want to learn the law, please come to Mumbai. I'm not sure that the lawyers and judges in Delhi would really agree to this today. But I made the choice and I came here and I joined the chambers of Mr. Temtan and Dhyarujana. My first brief was to mention before Justice Sujata Manohar in the corner court on the ground floor. I had a PhD from Harvard in my hand and I thought that for mentioning that brief for an early date, I will get a sizable fee. So the solicitor from Mullah and Mullahs told me, I asked him, how much do you charge for this kind of a docket? So he said, it's your first brief, so you can mark your docket as you want to mark it. So I said, but please tell me, because I'm not quite sure about what I should be marking. 
So he says, well, for this kind of a brief, you normally mark a fee of five guineas. But since it's your first brief, I don't mind increasing it to seven. So that was a reminder that Harvard PhD under your belt aside, you're worth seven guineas in a court in Bombay, as it then was. But I joined the chambers of Mr. Andhyarushana. I first went to him and called him sir. And he said, look, there are no sirs in the legal profession because we are all equals. And from that day, I started calling him Temtan. Temtan was my senior, my mentor and my guide. But that represented a sense of equality at the bar. I can't say that my juniors called me that. My all juniors all called me sir and they still call me sir. But there was something about this tradition about being equals in the chamber of being equals intellectually and being involved in this common endeavor to find principle and the balance of justice. But we had some remarkable lawyers to whom I owe a debt of gratitude. We had Mr. Milin Sakhardande, very distinguished lawyer who generally practiced in the city civil court, but had a lot of practice in the Bombay High Court as well. He had a fear of flying. So because he had a fear of flying, he would ensure that all his cases when they went to the Supreme Court would be engaged with a junior who used to associate with this chamber. So he would put his hand into his coat pocket, pull out as much money as he could stuff into yours and say, go to Delhi tomorrow, there's a matter which is coming for admission. I was once mentioning a matter without a brief in hand. Mr. Nitin Thakkar, who is now the president of the bar and sitting there, came to me quietly and said, Dikra, never mention a matter without a scrap of paper in your hand. If it's, even if it's a wrong brief, have some brief in your hand. Ashok Desai, about whom I spoke this morning, the doyen of the bar. Firdos Talyar Khan, who unfortunately we lost to a Himalayan trekking accident at the peak of his career. I was briefed with Firdos. And Firdos said, well, how much were you planning to mark in this matter? So he said, well, if I mark 200, you will get one third the fee, which would be 60. But I'll increase my fee to 500. So your fee can be increased as well. We had distinguished judges before whom we appeared. Justice Pense. When you pass by Justice Pense's court at two o'clock, you better be sure that it was two o'clock because he would enter the court not one minute before two o'clock and not half a minute after two o'clock. We learned from Justice Pense the ability to be precise in the most complex of original side appeals. The ability to frame minutes of the orders of which he was such a great exponent. I learned a great deal in the court of Ramesh's father, Justice D.R. Dhanuka, whom we used to very fondly call Dr. Dhanuka because he was D.R. Dhanuka, an erudite scholar who also took up judgeship at the age of a ripe old 50 plus to dedicate himself to the cause of justice. He knew he was not going to go to the Supreme Court or even become a chief justice, but he took up justice in this mission to do justice to others. It was Chief Justice P.D. Desai. Every morning, Chief Justice P.D. Desai's court would be full of what we would call the Desai Darbar. We would say the Darbar is full in Justice P.D. Desai's court because that was the time before the mediation movement had started that Chief Justice P.D. Desai would have scores of young or, or scores of litigants, labor, rent act, just name it. And he would be trying to do mediations in practice in that courtroom. It was an object example, brilliance in administrative law, completely oblivious to who was the senior on the other side and a fierce desire to do justice. A person who told the Chief Justice of India when he was called to the Supreme Court, sorry, he said, I would rather retire as the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court because he had been superseded by the appointment of somebody before him who was junior to him in the Gujarat High Court. Chief Justice Chittatosh Mukherjee, as a young lawyer, I attended the resolutions of our bar when we decided to boycott four judges of this court because we believed that they had transgressed the line of integrity. Those were tumultuous times. 
when the chief justice of the high court decided not to give work to four judges it required an extraordinary act of courage on the part of the chief justice to say that i will not assign work to these judges because my bar has said that these judges are not deserving of being judges of this court so these were tumultuous times for us i learned so much from vt walawalkar he would call you to the court sit next to you and narrate not what matter he was arguing next but give you in your hands a piece of literature that he was writing some thought on human rights some thought on social reform and make you reflect on it and then ask you what do you think of what i have written that was vt walawalkar who passed away as he was in harness arguing a case in our court when he passed away there was mr m a rane the founder of the people's union for civil liberties with mr v m tarkunde so the likes of rane were the people who's who have kept the torch of liberty burning bright when that torch was becoming dim during the years of the emergency in 1975 so many of you here as judges have appeared before me i'm sure you've also appeared before many i have spoken about it was a fearless sense of independence of our court which saved indian democracy in 1975 when you had the likes of justice rm kantawala or justice vidi tulzapurkar they were the judges who said that the writ of habeas corpus must be available even when article 21 is suspended during the time of an emergency so that is how indian democracy still stands firm because of the fierce tradition of our own court of the judges of the bar who have come together and hoisted the flag the flag and the torch of freedom for which our court stands and has always stood so many of you have appeared before me either as lawyers or even as judicial officers in the registry but i learned such a great deal from all of you i learned a great deal about the state of affairs of our own district judiciary from colleagues such as mr v r kingaunkar who then became a judge of the high court justice bhadang justice r c chavan who is now my deputy in the e committee of the supreme court just sitting back and listening to them gave me a true picture of the true state of the judiciary in those days there was something called the lordships fund and the lordships fund was a collection of money which our judicial officers would put together so as to devote hospitality when judges were traveling to the district but learning about this and learning about how the district judiciary had to dance attendance on high court judges when they happened to go to the districts gave us a different vision because when we learned these stories of right and wrong from our own seniors in the district judiciary who had come to the high court whether as judges of the high court or as members of the of the of the, of the registry we felt perhaps there is another way of doing things and the reason why many of those practices are now extinct is because of what we have learned in terms of our own interaction with those judges but i also want to say a few things and i am not either being harsh or patronizing so please don't misunderstand me because i am what i am and i owe everything to the institution of the bombay high court so who am i to say anything which is not laudatory but the strength of the bombay high court and the reason why the institution is why it is today is because of its ability to write to formulate and to lay down law for the future which takes me back to the point which i made when i referred to this conversation with justice ap shah just ap shah was sitting with justice dk deshmukh when an order written by me in a matter it was a challenge to the ban on the play me nathuram godse bolto ahe 
I'd sat at about nine o'clock in the night on my vacation assignment and I had washed the band and allowed the play to go on. So DK, as we fondly called him, asked Ajit Bhai, why did he have to write so much? So Ajit Bhai called me in the lunch and said, you chalk out your own course of conduct for the future. What kind of judge do you want to be? Do you want to write? Do you want to, do you want to possess the ability to shape society? I took the call for myself and I'm not saying that each of you should take the call for yourselves. You will by and by take the call for yourselves. But I do believe that the ability and strength of the Bombay High Court lies in the strength of its written word. So do I know that judges are hard pressed for time today. The volume of litigation has undergone a quantum increase in terms of leaps and bounds. But do step back and take time for yourself to formulate doctrine because that would be the key to sustaining the high court in the future. The second point, apart from the ability to write that I want to emphasize, is the ability to assimilate diverse strands of thought and expression. We are all judges in this global metropolis that is Mumbai. I think it is our respect for the beliefs of others who do not believe as we are. I believe that our respect for others who do not think as we think. Our belief for others who don't dress as we dress. That sense of belief sustains the inclusion and the diversity of our society. And that sense of inclusion and diversity in our society is a cause of its stability, tranquility, and its ability to sustain constitutional values in the future. One of the lessons which I have learned during my own 22 years on this side of the bench is that you're constantly judging the lives of others. But I try to judge, which I'm duty bound to do without being judgmental. Now, it's a very thin line, which you ask yourselves, how do I judge without being judgmental? Of course, we are duty bound to judge because that's our duty and our oath under the constitution. But at the same time, I do believe it's important not to be judgmental on the lives of others. Be accepting of the right of others to live the lives that they want to live unless they transgress the law. And even if they transgress the law, it's important that we understand why people do as they do. Because that gives us some sort of an insight into what befalls even the worst of crime in our society. The third point which I want to emphasize is that it's important for us as judges to do everything that we can to attract the best talent into the Bombay High Court. And there I do believe that judges have a vital role in providing mentorship to the bar. I was speaking this morning to several of you and I did mention that it's becoming increasingly difficult to attract the best talent to the bench, particularly in global metropolises like Mumbai or Delhi. And now it's spreading to Bangalore and other places as well. Which is not to say that those who are there today are not the best. Of course, they are the best. Because all of you have accepted judgeship at a great amount of sacrifice. But looking to the future, I think it's important that we mentor young talent. Right at the time when they are 37 or 38 or 39, Tell them that you are under watch now. Perhaps you are now under consideration that you will become a judge in the next five or six or seven years. So that you, we instill upon them the idea that they would be important elements of the decision-making process in this institution. I think that mentorship of young talent at the bar is crucial. If our courts have to, it's after, if our courts have to survive for the future, Whenever I called upon young lawyers to become judges and if they said no, I always tell them, I always told them one thing. I said, if you don't accept judgeship today, then you will get 25 years down the line the judges you deserve. And we have to guard against that, not for today, but from what will be, say, 15 or 20 years down the line, if the best don't come over to this institution in which all of you have 
a very important uh, role to play. Well, Bombay has a very strong contingent in the Supreme Court of India. Justice Bhushan Gavai, Justice Oak, Justice Dipankar Datta. I don't think you're from Calcutta now. You're really from Bombay. <laughs> At least by the applause which Dipankar you got this evening. And I do hope and I'm sure that we'll, I'll continue to get the support of each one of them as we contribute for the future. Just a final few words. The nature of the judicial institution has changed over the last decade. There's an increasing emphasis on technology in our functioning. We couldn't have functioned if it was not for technology during the times of COVID. The infrastructure which we have put into place during COVID should not be dismantled. It has to be used. Our court represents a global commercial metropolis. And I think it's important that we use technology even if we are not comfortable with technology. Technology is not meant for geeks. Technology is meant for duds. Because the back office of technology is complex. But the front end of technology is as simple as it can be because it is intended for the use of everyone like you and me who wants easy to use technological tools. The district judiciary, both within the and outside the High Court. I was delighted to learn that the Madhya Pradesh High Court has passed a resolution today, yesterday saying that here on the district judiciary shall not be referred to as a subordinate judiciary. And I think that's a very important symbol of the, of the district judiciary being equals. Unlike, say, the civil services, where young collectors or young members of the civil service are treated as equals, in the judiciary, we have this sense of subordination, that sense of hierarchy. And that sense of hierarchy prevents us from getting the best inputs. There is this divide between those who come from the services and those who come from the bar. I think that sense of hierarchy, that sense of divide must end because there's much that contributes to the enrichment of the high courts from those who come from the services. The members of the bar bring a sense of freshness of a recent experience with the legal profession. The members of the service who come to the high courts bring the sense of continuity, of tradition, which is so important for judicial institutions. Finally, I must conclude by telling you of a little, of a little incident which has shaken me to the core. I probably took much longer than I should have, but I'll end with this incident which has moved me to the core. It's all about an autobiography written by one of our own judges recently. Some of you may have read that autobiography. So very dear sister to all of us. And I was shaken to the core when I read the autobiography a few months ago. She narrates an incident in the autobiography. She says that there was a criminal prosecution to which her husband was, was subject when she was a member of the district judiciary. And she says in her autobiography, and I'm, I'm referring to it because it's now published material. I wouldn't have shared it if it was unpublished, privacy protected information. And she says that there was one evening when they were sitting together, husband and wife, and they had decided to write a suicide note and go to the nearest railway line and allow a passing train to end their lives. And she says that they had just written out the note and they were wondering what time was the best time to leave their home when a phone call came. It so happened that the phone call was from me. And I told her that I was just sitting on the committee of judges to review judgments. And your judgments have been rated as A+. plus, So it's just a matter of a short time that you will now be moving from 
that side to this side. And she writes in her autobiography that that little phone call was perhaps a message to her that, well, the time had yet not come and the time was yet not right. So she says, we tore up that letter, put it in the waste paper basket and then continued to see uh, another day. I'm sharing this with all of you because at the end of it all, I think the worth of the lives which we lead depends upon whether we leave the world a slightly better place to live in if this indeed were the last day of our life. The very beautiful book written by a professor at Stanford, which is called The Last Lecture. And in the last lecture, the very distinguished professor who was detected to have a terminal ailment says, we cannot ever change the hand that we are dealt with, but we can certainly change the way we play the hand. So at the end of it all, really, I think it's for us to decide how do we as judges leave the world a slightly better place to live in if this indeed were to be the last day which is the motto with which I try and lead my life every day. So I began by saying that this is an exceptionally emotional moment for me today. Uh, I took a little more time than I should have, but you will pardon the lapse of someone who owes everything indeed to this high court and to this high court alone. Thank you very much.